Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. I'm Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. Welcome. So before we get into the case that we're going to talk about tonight, we have a few things to tell you. In our show notes and description for every episode, you will find links to our social media if you want to follow us there. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to get updates about new episodes, Patreon episodes, memes, breaking news, all that good stuff. We also have links to our Threadless where you can get merch like shirts and bags and phone cases, all the good stuff. And we have a link to our Patreon which is patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast, where you can get bonus episodes and content and ad free episodes as well. And the last thing we have in our show notes is uh, resources that we used for our research. So if you want to read a little bit more about the stories or see uh, where we got our information from, you can check out those resources. And I also put some links to resources for things like domestic violence and bullying and suicide hotlines, stuff like that, if you ever need those. And we have- We're on Facebook. Yeah. We're on Twitter. We have an Instagram. And we have an email. (laughs) Murderdictionarypodcast at gmail.com. And we also have new people on our Patreon. So I know last time we recorded, I totally spaced on getting the names for our new patrons. And so I couldn't say thank you to you guys. So I just wanted to circle back and thank the new people on our Patreon who are Jenna, Gia, Casey, Shahaya. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Sheha. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm completely butchering your name. But... Thank you. And also Kelly and Kyle. So thank Thank you, you guys. And I think that's pretty much it. We've got everything. That's the list, right? Patreon, social media, threadless, resources. We can get into our case. Sounds good. So we are on letter N and we're doing New York cases. And this is a lot to take. It's there's so much. There's so much and so many different eras within the New York crimes. There's different categories within themselves, right? You know, like this one's an old timey case. You can explore some mobster cases. You can explore crack epidemic cases. I mean, there's just so many different eras of crime for New York. Yeah, it's like every era, every decade of New York from the beginning of time has some thing going on which crime spreads underground totally in the forefront it just depends on the time yeah but there's always something going on yeah there's really an endless well of new york cases but this is one that i mean courtney and i have discussed like it is so strange to me that i had never really heard of this case before because it has so many twists and turns and is just a very fascinating case. And it is New York's very first female serial killer. So it's a really interesting one that really I haven't heard of. I don't know how Lizzie Halliday's name isn't like a JonBenet Ramsey notoriety. <laughs> right. Yeah, it should be like, you know, Black Dahlia or something like it should be something that everybody knows of, you know? Yes. It's it's interesting that people that are into true crime like us or haven't heard of it, you know? Yeah. So let's get into it. So let's. Liz- <laughs> Lizzie Halliday was born Eliza Margaret McNally in Antrim, Ireland in 1864. I almost said 1964, but no, it's real old timey. Real, well, real is, old timey. I mean, this is Civil War. Right. That's what's going on right now in America. So she was only three years old when her family brought her to the United States where they settled in Pennsylvania. And really, life must have been extremely hard for the large McNally family when they arrived in the U.S. because it's safe to say her parents had a very difficult time providing for their nine children. Kill me. 
I can't even imagine in this period of time, things are tough. And if you have nine kids, I don't even know how you make it. And do you think that maybe she had 11 and only nine made it, right? Uh, I know. It's old timey. And just childbirth in the 1860s in general, nine times. Right. I just can't imagine going through that over and over again. And then once they're here, just not really being able to provide for them, you know? So true. Like once they're here, now you have 18 eyes looking at you too. (laughs) Do something about it, mom. Like what? I gave birth nine times. What do you want? I know all those people in quarantine right now that are, you know, parents of one child and trying to homeschool them. Like imagine... Like you said, 18 pairs of eyes looking at you, like, (laughs) just like, teach me something, feed me, do things for me. That's when uh, the three-year-old and the four-year-old become a shoeshine and a paper route boy. Exactly. Yeah. They put everybody to work in this era, of course. So even as a young child, Lizzie was very difficult and she could not stay out of trouble for her entire life from a very early age. It wasn't long before she got a reputation in their town for being confrontational and even violent as a kid. Childhood. That's just, it's very extreme. You don't hear about that a lot. So she got into fights with anyone and everyone to the point where people avoided her so they wouldn't get attacked. And she, if you can imagine, was like this little kid at five years old People would like cross the street and walk on the other side of the street to get away from her, a five-year-old, you know? Wow. Yeah. Although Lizzie was short, people were still really afraid of the young, small girl who people described as having a pointy nose and red hair. Her most intimidating feature was her dark blue sunken eyes that sat under thick eyebrows which some people said made her look like a snake. Wow. Right? Imagine this little, like, (laughs) kids are kind of creepy. Imagine this little snake-looking five-year-old walking down the street with, like, purpose and intention and evil in her eyes. Of course you'd walk across the street and get away from her, you know? Yeah. Normally it's like, you know, oh, she has such beautiful blue eyes. Right. Look at how cute. No. She was like a horror movie child. Not only were people around the neighborhood afraid of Lizzie, but even her own family members would frequently get into fights with her. She was rebellious and stubborn with her parents, and her temper caused fights with many of her siblings. Of course, there was plenty to choose from. By the time she was a teenager... The fighting had become so bad that her parents eventually kicked Lizzie out because she was a danger to her brothers and sisters. This is 1865 kicking her out, by the way. This is Civil War, like post-Civil War now probably, era kicking out a child because they're in fear of their other kid's physical life. Right. She's like 13, 14, I think, years old when she's just out on the street on her own. It was such a problem and she was such a danger to everybody else that they put a 14-year-old out on the street rather than have her in the home and be a danger to everybody else. It's wild. It says a lot about her behavior and about how scared they were. Yeah. You know, there's really no accounts of her parents being bad parents or anything. It's really just like they were trying to keep everybody safe, you know? Yeah. In 1879, when Lizzie was only 15 years old, she married a man named Charles Hopkins, who people referred to as Ketspool Brown, which His just nicknames. like, I know <laughs> what it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know where old timey nicknames come from. You know, it's so I, weird. I like to always, you know, oh, I bet you this and that. I don't even have a guess for this one. Right. (laughs) Like there's no, most of them you can think like, oh, there's a story there or it's about a physical attribute, you know, like Shorty McNeil or something, you know. Tall Charles. But it's like, oh, my name is Brianna Mira. But, you know, my friends call me Betty Smith. Makes no sense. (laughs) Yes, that's a good one. 
By the time she was 16, Lizzie had become a mom to a baby boy, although she just definitely wasn't the most motherly person. As you can imagine, Some, she just didn't have those kind of qualities. Somebody had sex with her. Like, yes. I mean, right? Like, and that's all it took to be a mother. <laughs> There was and no other qualities she had other than the right uh, equipment downstairs to make a baby. <laughs> That's it. And did she like cut this guy's dick off after? Because she's not exactly the friendliest. No. <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I can't imagine that she's like, nobody ever, you know, uh, fucked her and was like, oh, we made love. I don't imagine that that's the case. <laughs> this was hard work. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So within two years of getting married, her husband, Charles, died. Huh. Even though she was a recent widow, people found it a bit suspicious that she didn't seem that upset when he died. And on top of that, she rebounded with a new man shortly after her husband's death. Talk of the town. Yeah, I mean, that's there's a lot of people talking about Lizzie. I think her entire life, people were gossiping about her. Yeah. You know, from an early age where it was like, oh, she's getting into trouble. Then it was like, she's violent and we're scared of her. Then it was the men she was dating. She always had people talking about her. But she wasn't really doing herself any favors with her behavior. That's for sure. Any attention is good attention. Right, right. While Lizzie was busy dating a new, much older man, she also decided that she did not want to be a mother anymore. And she figured that she needed to leave her child behind. And although it's unclear whether her son really had any issues at all, she had the young boy committed to a state mental health facility. And what they called it when they were reporting on this at the time, it was a institution for the, quote, feeble-minded. But we really don't know if there's any records of him actually having any sort of mental health issues or disabilities. It just is amazing what you could get away with back then. That's exactly right. I mean, I think she was just trying to get rid of him. And she's like, oh, well... He does this, that, and the other thing, and just kind of making up these stories to get him care where she didn't have to take care of him. Yeah. Around this time, people began to say that Lizzie herself would have what was described as, quote, spells of insanity. And to me, this seems like uh, not just old-timey mental health issues, but more along the lines of like rage and violence problems. You know what I mean? It's, like, yeah. Yeah. I don't necessarily think like there's a diagnosis of like, oh, she had manic depression or schizophrenia or something. I don't think it was that. I think she really had just rage and violence and anger management issues. It was like blackout anger. Yeah. She would really see red yeah. and just destroy whatever was in front of her. It's like they describe when Ted Bundy would get angry, his eyes would change and they would turn all black. Like, I would bet that she would have these, like, not exactly the same, but, you know, the rage spells. We'll call it insanity spells because we don't have a word yet, but it's a rage disorder. Right. I mean, that's the perfect way to describe it. That's the perfect comparison. She had those yeah. what were at the time spells of insanity, quote unquote, but really they're Ted Bundy eyes, like... She would turn into snake eyes and just freak out on whoever was the target of her anger. So, snake eyes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. As she entered into adulthood, people no longer dismissed her as just a troublemaking teen. And they started to take these violent outbursts much more seriously. After a quick courtship, a still teenage Lizzie married Artemis Brewer who was a veteran and pensioner who was much older than her. Sounds like Lizzie's M.O. Right. She definitely has this kind of pattern. She's always seeking out much older men. And I think there's a lot behind this. You know, they're easier for her to control. I think that she needs people to fall in line and she needs to be in control. I think that maybe... Like my theory is growing up in this household with a bunch of other kids, she had to share everything. She didn't have control over things. But if she's just worrying about one older man, 
and that's their household, that's their little family, she can be in charge of everything, you know? Definitely. So she definitely sought out this particular type of person, and we'll see it play out over and over again throughout her whole life. It wasn't long before people began noticing that the newlyweds didn't have such a blissful, loving relationship. Lizzie would often hit her husband or pull his hair, and since he was much older, she would take advantage of his weakness. Aww. Yeah, it was really just a situation where she was like, oh, he's older. She was doing total elder abuse to him. Yeah. And people could see it. It's not like she was private about it. Everybody knew. Before they could even celebrate their one-year wedding anniversary, her husband, Artemis, mysteriously died. Later, the New York Times would write, quote, whether these men died natural deaths or were murdered is not known. If you have a question, right, I have the answer. Then it's not a question. It's yeah. just New York Times legal way of being like, we're not saying she murdered them, but... She didn't allegedly. not murder them, you know? That's the original allegedly. Exactly. Because they can't really say it. But I mean, really, if you've got a couple husbands already and you're barely 20 and two husbands have died, yeah. we're looking at a pattern here. After Artemis died, Lizzie quickly moved on to a man named Hiram Parkinson, who she dated for almost a year. And Hiram must have felt like something was wrong with either their relationship or just with Lizzie because he ended up breaking up with her. And he's really the only one that we know of that broke up with Lizzie. Yeah. Yeah, everyone seemed to stay, even through abuse and really big red flags. They always stayed. So it really makes me wonder what happened with him, what Hiram saw that he was like, oh, I got to get out of here. Hmm. And we don't really know, like, specifically why they broke up, but it must have been something big for them to go from just a happy couple, like on their little honeymoon, to breaking up really quickly. By all accounts, Hiram completely vanished without a trace after this. It's really mysterious. That is bizarre. Right? But that's kind of what you get with old-timey cases. People just disappear. That's true. He's probably just in the next city. He was like, I got to get away. And so packed up a horse or something, went to the next city, like you said, and that's it. He's disappeared. Yeah. He's vanished <laughs> without a trace. Never to be seen again. Right. Once Hiram was gone, Lizzie started dating one of her second husband Artemis's old army friends named George Smith. She doesn't really go outside of this. It's just a lot of these old dudes that all know each other. Right. It's networking, Court. It is networking. <laughs> what am I thinking? Oh, my gosh. You're totally right. It's old oh, dude networking. Idiot. It's just like, oh, well, he's got a friend and they've got a friend and just looking for the oldest dudes in town, you know? The old dude Facebook page suggested friends. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what this is. <laughs> Try this guy on. Try on George Smith. <laughs> So George was yet another much older man who she was probably hoping to kill off without suspicion again because of his age. Those were her targets. She was always going after the same thing. Despite the fact that he had witnessed the mistreatment his friend had endured, George decided that he wanted to marry Lizzie anyway. Only a few months after the wedding, Lizzie tried to kill her new husband by giving him tea with poison in it. Fortunately, he survived the murder attempt, and when he woke up, George immediately suspected his wife was behind the life-threatening incident. It, it's got to be saying a lot that as soon as you wake up, you're like, my wife did it, you know? Yeah, completely says something. I mean... It's just, it's obvious that your wife is trying to kill you. I mean. 
right? Yeah. He's just like, okay, so she tried to do it to this guy. Now she's doing it to me. So he probably, the reason he so like sits up in bed and just goes, she's trying to kill me is because he watched this happen before. And so the one thing goes wrong and he's like, okay, that's it. She's trying to kill me. Yeah. I mean, Maybe. really, it's just, it doesn't take much to put two and two together. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, as soon as he wakes up and realizes this, he's like planning to confront his wife. He's like, I got to get to Lizzie and talk to her about this and tell her I know. But while he was still in the hospital recovering, she disappeared. Again, she went to the next town over, like you said. (laughs) It doesn't take much to disappear in this era. That's a guilty plea. Right? It's like, we know if you're going to run, it's like if you lawyer up, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, we know you fucked up. So not only did she leave her husband without saying a word, but she also packed up everything she could steal and took his money. She used some of the stolen money to change her name to Maggie Hopkins and she moved to Bellows Falls, Vermont. That's definitely further than we usually see them moving. Right. She she might be able to fall off the map. <laughs> yeah. With this one. I mean, really, it's like you only see local news in this era. So it's like if it's not a town or two over, nobody's going to know that this Lizzie character had tried to murder multiple husbands. Yeah, like once George recovers, he's going to go on and be like, man, this crazy bitch, I never saw her again, but then he's going to marry her sister or something, and everything will be fine. But yeah, she'll be in Vermont, like just a state over. Like nothing nothing ever happened. Yeah, no. No one's going to look for it. It's so easy to repeat your crimes in these eras because you could just disappear, change your name, and nobody knows anything. A lot of the men, too, are too embarrassed to say that, like, they were had by a stupid woman, you know? Right, yes. And so a lot of this stuff, like, yeah, she left town. I'm fine with that. Goodbye. Yeah, chalk it up to machismo (laughs) or whatever, you know? It's just like, Mm -hmm. okay, I can't admit that she got the best of me or whatever. They'll all tell him so. I told you so. She was crazy. Right. She was a snake eye girl. (laughs) You married her. So once she reached Vermont, Lizzie quickly married Charles Playstill. But after only two weeks, she robbed him and left. Over and over again. No, she's not even like trying to put up a front, you know? No. And that's the thing. Like, she could start over a new life, have a new identity, and just blend in. You know, like I would think I would get tired of chaos, of running, of, you know, just being like trying to avoid the law for this so much time. You could just settle down and just chill the fuck out, you know, and she's addicted to the chaos and the hurting people, I think, you know. Yeah. I earned a bachelor's degree in communications and ended up working behind a desk. Now, I've found a new way, the Felician way. And I'm becoming a nurse through Felician University's accelerated BSN program. Felician ABSN is available in two accelerated formats, a hybrid program in Persephone and an on-ground program in Rutherford. Either way, you'll also gain real-world experience in labs and clinicals at top New Jersey hospitals. Turn your non-nursing education into a nursing career. Search Felician ABSN. After the relationship with Charles was over, she reunited with her son, who was released from the institution, and she married a man named Henry. But really, there's nothing beyond just the record of their marriage. We don't have any information about their relationship other than the fact that they got a marriage certificate. Hmm. After Henry, Lizzie relocated back to Philadelphia to stay with her childhood friend, Margaret McQuillan. So back when Lizzie was in Ireland and she was a baby, her family had lived next to the McQuillan family. And both families had all come to the United States together at the same time. And they both families like moved to Philly. So they grew up together. Yes. Lizzie and Margaret had grown up together. They had been childhood friends. And basically, when she was kind of in a desperate spot and needed some help, she was just like, who can I call? 
okay, I'll call my old childhood friend. She'll have my back, right? So when she needed to get out of town, she called up Margaret McQuillan and she asked for a place to stay. Margaret was kind enough to allow Lizzie to stay with her in Philly along with her husband, John, and their teenage daughter, Sarah. While she was in Philly, Lizzie almost seemed to have a normal life. This was the closest that she got to being stable and being on her feet. She settled in with the McQuillan family, and she opened up her own shop, but things didn't stay peaceful for long. Do you know what kind of shop it was? I don't know. I assumed it was kind of a general store. That's what I thought. Yeah, but I think maybe that just might be my um, imagination of what old-timey shops are, (laughs) you know? It may have been a women's store with women's clothing or something, but I don't know. It's probably a general store, like mercantile. Yes, that's what I I figured. I just never found any information about what kind of specific shop it was. So basically, what happened was that it really wasn't generating enough profit because she had envisioned that like right away she would just be raking in the money. And so when it didn't meet her standards, Lizzie decided that she would burn it down and collect the insurance money. Oh, a little signature exotic Joe move. Right. Exactly. I just called him exotic Joe. Joe exotic. Burning (laughs) shit down and blaming other people. In 1888, 24-year-old Lizzie burned down her own shop, along with the McQuillan Saloon and two businesses on either side. Damn. Yeah. I mean, it was, you can't really control a fire and it's old timey. Everything is wood. Like, I mean, it's just a powder keg. I mean, really, there was no way to control this and keep it to just her shop. That sucks. So it was completely devastating to multiple families who lost their businesses, you know. The police were immediately suspicious of Lizzie, and she was soon arrested on charges of insurance fraud and arson. She was convicted and sentenced to two years in prison at Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia. While Lizzie was in prison, her son was sent to a juvenile facility where it's reported that he exhibited the same kind of violent temper as his mother. Not surprising. No, no, not at all. He's been institutionalized almost his whole life. Like, how is he going to come out and relate to people normally? Right. I mean, the kind of issues of abandonment on top of when you are with your mother, she's got these anger issues. We don't know what he endured at the hands of the various facilities he was in because he's not their child. They're not going to love him and care for him like he's, you know, a vulnerable child and part of their family, you know? Yeah. They're just trying to, with these big, like, boys' homes and whatnot, they're trying to create obedient citizens, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I can't imagine him not growing up with anger issues and really, you know, struggling. When Lizzie McNally was released a couple years later, she changed her name to Lizzie Brown and moved to Newburgh in upstate New York. A lot of aliases. Right? Over and over again, just changing mm-hmm. her name, whether it's marriages or actually just legally changing her name. She's got to have like 30 names throughout her life. Yeah. And again, that's like a signature of an old timey case. Yep. So she got a job as a maid working for a widower named Paul Halliday, who was an older Civil War veteran in his 70s. And of course, nosy neighbors gossiped about how the new woman in town took late night walks and that she looked evil. Her new boss, Paul, and his wife had previously raised five children together before the wife passed away. By 1889, when he hired 25-year-old Lizzie, Four of Paul's children had moved out and he lived with one son who had a disability, and he was a caretaker for. 
Paul had a coal business that did not generate a lot of money, but pretty much everything that he did earn, he spent at the local tavern. So by all accounts, Paul was a very lonely and seemingly depressed elderly man with kind of a failing business. Yeah. And he's taking care of his son and he's alone. Yeah, just... Of course he's at the bar. It really seemed like, yeah, he was just that old guy that had seen a whole lot of shit, been through a whole lot of hard times, and he was at the end of the bar just talking about his troubles. Yep. You can, everyone can picture that character, you know? That was Paul. Initially, Lizzie got along with Paul and his sons really well, and eventually... 70-year-old Paul asked 26-year-old Lizzie to marry him. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Girardi? <laughs> that's perhaps. a big age gap. Even for old-timey standards, that's, that's pretty really big. It really is. That is a very big, even old-timey gap. Yeah. It's surprising that he was even alive at 70 in this era. I mean... That is a fact. And then also just the fact that he's like looking ahead to his life, that he's like, I'd love to have a wife. I mean, he might not be alive in six months. Right. <laughs> but he's probably know. pickled. You know how people that like the ladies that are 110 and live off like a Coors and a pack of Marlboro Reds every day? <laughs> yes. This guy went to battle, came back, and he's just Norm at the bar. Right. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. fine with it. He's like, well, if I can get a 26-year-old to marry Murray, me, I'm sure going to do it. I mean, why not? Wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I can hear this guy talking. Yeah, but I mean, that's her MO, though. You know, he may not know that because this is her first time in Newburgh in upstate New York. She's brand new in town. So he doesn't know this is a pattern for her. Nobody knows that. But he's just thinking he's a lucky 70-year-old, you know? He could have dementia. Maybe. We that don't know. Is, maybe that's a little bit to do with it, too, is she's just like, well, old people get crazy and you can do whatever you want. So I think there's a lot of just looking for the right mark with her. Absolutely. And she's, yeah. you know, known to be a physical abuser, but you yeah. make a perfect point. I mean, she's doing elderly abuse on many different fronts. She can say dismissively like oh you know he's getting a little bit older so he doesn't really remember that he prepared his own teacup you know yes. what I mean like yes. she can get away with things because of his age and just blame it on that you know yeah. so there's many things many ways that she's using age as her advantage so of course because this is kind of a scandalous age gap there was a lot of chatter amongst neighbors that Paul may have married Lizzie because he just wanted to avoid paying her for the work she was doing at his house. Ooh. Yeah. That's not good. No. But I think, I mean, I'm kind of torn on this. I think he probably just, like we said, feels like a lucky 70-year-old that was able to score a 26-year-old, you know? Yeah. I really think that he thought that's what it is. And, you know, someone that's used to being married for so long and is a widower, he's just like, well, I, I want to have a woman around. And if this yeah. young woman wants to be with me, what am I going to do? Turn her away? You I'll know, like <laughs> she's going to take care of my house and be my wife. And I miss having a wife. Like, I think that's just what he chalked it up to is like, well, this is perfect, you know. Yeah. That's at least how I see it from the outside. We'll never know. We don't have any quotes from him. But I assume he was just kind of like, this is a perfect arrangement. Yeah. Everyone in the community seemed to know that Lizzie was combative and that their marriage seemed unhappy. The relationship was tumultuous from the very beginning. And it wasn't long before Lizzie was looking for company outside her marriage. So she began having an affair with a neighbor. At first, you want to be like, she's insatiable. But then you remember <laughs> that all these men that she's marrying are like three second 70 year olds, right? So, yeah, I'm not surprised that like 
Not only is she difficult, but she just fucks everybody in town. <laughs> well, 70 year olds before Viagra, too. So it's not even like saying. they can have a healthy sex life. <laughs> like, the one she's just like, I shit. gotta get it somewhere. Yeah. You know, yeah, she's yeah. like, I'm still 26. You know? There it is. <laughs> There it is. And she hasn't even hit her sexual peak yet. Wait till she's in her mid 30s to 40s. Right. And they're in a, <laughs> and they're in their hundred and tens. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, she's, you know, it's it's not right. But, you know, by all accounts, she's like, I'm 26. I'm going to go find it. And she was, yep. you know, out with neighbors. And she seemed to particularly fall for one neighbor that she was having an affair with. On May 6, 1891, Lizzie started a fire inside their home. Then, just a few weeks later, on May 26, she burned down one of the large barns that was on their property. It was the one they kept the alligators in. (laughs) Oh, Lord. Yep. After the barn fire, she stole Paul's horses to make a speedy escape and ran away with the neighbor that she was having the affair with. Horse thieving at this point, too, is a really, this is like car theft, like very serious crime. Yes, of course. You see a ton of old timey cases with horse thievery as one of the first crimes that the perpetrator commits before murder. It's like a gateway crime. People would get hung for hanging for uh, stealing horses. Yeah. Oh, no. It was a huge crime. A big yeah. deal. So they didn't get very far on horse before her lover actually abandoned her. So she sold the horses and attempted to travel undetected while on the run. Huh. But she didn't last very long on the road before she was arrested for horse thievery. There it is. <laughs> Her lawyer assisted her in using an insanity plea to help her avoid jail time. And the tactic worked. She was declared insane. Then the case was dismissed and she was committed to Middletown Asylum. During a transfer to the nearby Auburn Asylum, she had a violent outburst where she smashed the windows of the facility and attacked the sheriff. She was such a handful that she was transferred again to the Mattiswan Asylum, where she continued to have these violent episodes. Jeez. After a while, Lizzie was able to persuade her husband, Paul, to help her get out of the institution. So with his help, he convinced the asylum that she was completely rehabilitated and ready to return home. There was no evidence that this was true whatsoever. I mean, okay. (laughs) Right. But she's an expert manipulator. I mean, by all accounts, she was an abusive wife. And she was able to convince her husband to work to get her back home. Knowing that she was just going to come home and be abusive again and cheat on him again. Yeah. It's just, I can't even imagine, like, how that's possible. I (laughs) changed. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know damn well she's just going to do the same thing when she comes home. So it's just insane to me that she was able to convince him to get her back home. Uh Uh-huh. So once she was back with Paul, things, of course, did not stay peaceful for long. Wait, what? Yeah. No, shocker, right? Oh, my God. I thought this was the end. I thought we were done, everyone. Okay. (laughs) She's cured. Yeah, I (laughs) know. Not at all. Yeah. Lizzie was constantly fighting with Paul, with his sons, and she was even threatening to kill Paul. Multiple times people heard her make threats. She just did not give a fuck. She was Uh -uh. just rageful and violent and lashing out at everybody. In 1893, Lizzie burned down the mill that was on their property while his disabled son, John, was still inside. That's so awful. And you know what's really even like crazy, too, is you think about like this is 1893. She went into that first asylum in 91. So he fought like it was two years, 
two years of like, oh, let her out. She's okay. She gets out. She burns the shit down with his son inside. I mean, can you imagine like the regret and the I've made a huge mistake? Yeah, instantly. On Paul's end? Yeah. Because as soon as by all accounts, like she was home for a very short amount of time before the fire happened. Yeah. I mean, it was just like as soon as she got home, she couldn't help herself. She just really raged out, you know? Wherever Lizzie goes, fire follows. Exactly. That is the way it works. And, you know, just thinking, I mean, it was the house, the barn, then the mill. There's three fires on that property. That's just one property. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So what's beyond that even is that like right away the neighbors were thinking something was wrong because they all say that they knew she hated his son. So there were whispers that she had either intentionally killed him in the fire, knowing he was inside the mill, or even perhaps murdered him inside the house and then took his body into the mill and started the fire to cover up the crime. Hmm. So right away, everybody that knew the couple was suspecting foul play, that she had done it on purpose and that she had hurt him and killed him, you know purposefully. Lizzie was arrested, but once again, she was sent to an asylum instead of jail and then returned home when it was declared that she was, quote, cured. She's been cured a few times. It keeps happening. That's interesting. Yeah, I just, I don't understand what's going on. And I know that, you know, the mental health you know, industry was so young and just misguided. And there were so many problems with mental health facilities in this time. But it's just so sad that this just kept happening. And she was slipping through the cracks, you know, because then more people keep getting hurt. Yeah. Shortly after Lizzie returned home in August 1893, people noticed that Paul seemed to disappear. Oh, God. I know. When the neighbors asked, she said that her husband had traveled to Bloomingburg to do some masonry work. But his son said they didn't know that he was going out of town. I'm so sorry, but like what 80-year-old man is just like, I got to do some concrete work. Right. I've got to do some blocks. (laughs) Like... Stop it. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, she's just telling lies that there's no way are true. It's not even like his profession. You know what I mean? He works in coal. Like he's a business owner. He's not a <laughs> yeah, mason, right. right? No. And so not. it just why would he do this? And beyond that, like you said, he's an older man. If he went anywhere, he would tell his family, "Hey guys, I'm going out of town." I'll be back and I'll write you a postcard or something. Yeah. There's no reason for this man in his mid-70s to leave town to do manual labor, especially without telling anybody. No. So nobody, of course, believed Lizzie's story and they started snooping around the property. So by all accounts, there was like neighbors that would go on and just kind of look around, poke around the barn, poke around the mill and just see like if there was anything suspicious. Those are good neighbors. Right. I mean, you and I talk about that all the time. If you see something, say something, you know, look into it. Don't just take things at face value. If you know that this suspicious Lizzie character has burnt down multiple buildings and killed someone, you better watch out when someone disappears. Mm-hmm. So they were really responsible in trying to look out for Paul. But the thing was, when they were kind of snooping around, they didn't really find anything. There were no signs of Paul, no signs that he had left or that he was there, just nothing. But they feared the worst. So they were able to convince law enforcement to issue a search warrant. It was suspicious enough to where they had to get the police involved. During the search, Lizzie had another violent outburst where she used a board to attack people that were searching her home. 
So by all accounts, she was just kind of like inside the house. They serve her with the warrant. She grabs some sort of loose two by four or something and just starts swinging at everybody. It's going to be pretty easy for her attorney to say she's insane later when she's acting this way with the cops there, right? This master manipulator. Multiple Mm -hmm. witnesses seeing this. And we'll see that throughout the entire story that people are like, oh, she's insane. But then there's these other people that are like, yeah, but she's trying to act insane. And you can't really tell if she has mental health issues or if she's just trying to set everything up, every case up for her to get an insanity plea. Yeah. So police were eventually able to subdue her, and she agreed to accompany one of his sons to Bloomberg to prove that he was actually there working. While searching the home, detectives found a bullet under the bed, along with rope and a carpet that had bloodstains on it, but they didn't find any sign of Paul. So they continued searching and kept looking around the property, and they were shocked to find that there were two bodies in the barn that were barely concealed underneath a haystack. That is the most ridiculously old-timey, feels like the Midwest when I think of a haystack, like the visual, right? It's like cartoon stuff. Oh, yeah. Two bodies under the haystack in the back. Part of it is just if she's known for setting all these fires and doing all this fraud and stuff, I mean, why wouldn't she just take them out to like the field of their property and start a fire and be like, oh, I'm just burning garbage or something like that. Like that's her shit. Arson is her shit. She could have gotten rid of evidence. It doesn't really make sense that in this case, she wouldn't start a fire. I don't think she's uh, thinking too clear. No. No, you're right. I think that she's really like, I see it as kind of like just a rage fit where she just sees red, she kills people and that's that, you know. And it's probably, it's almost like, like John Wayne Gacy used to say that like once those bodies were under the house and every, like once he got the bodies under, they were no longer a problem. They completely went out of his brain. Like once they were, so that's why it's like he had no problem with 30 people's smelling underneath his house because once they were under there, they never, it was, it was totally compartmentalized. Hmm. That's interesting. That once they were under that house, they went out of his brain. He never thought of them as a problem again. Yeah, and maybe like, there is some okay, sense of there. like, if it's buried, you know, yeah. it, actually physically, then metaphorically and emotionally, it could just be buried in your mind. Yeah, I took care of it. It's fine. I don't have to think about it anymore. Huh. Even though you can see feet underneath it, but that's okay. There's a haystack on top. I'm fine. That's interesting. I never really, I never heard that about Gacy before. There's a thing on uh, Bob, it's some channel and Donnie Wahlberg is the host oh lord and there's stop i know but he's so cute there's two parts and it's uh it's john wayne gacy and it's like the whole stories and i've been it's one of my quarantine watches and it was very good Uh, very scary people is the name of the show Hmm. i'll have to check that out anyway yeah it's just it's very strange to me that she had done so many other things to like conceal crimes or commit fraud or whatever but it's just like she left this you know these bodies in the barn knowing that people are looking around and suspicious of her you know what I mean that's the thing that doesn't make sense to me is like if you're in a blackout rage and you can't make sense of things that only lasts so long we're assuming these people have been dead for days you've already come down and you're already thinking about how to cover this up because you covered the bodies with hay. But yeah. why not actually cover them up in a way that can't be traced back to you that can like, you can actually get rid of things, you know, that's, mm-hmm. the, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But I don't know, I'm, I'm sure I'm just reading too much into it. And I've watched way too much forensic files in my life. So that's where that is. <laughs> We're trying to put logic and reason on the illogical. And we can't do that. And I nope. always have the bad habit of doing so. Yep. So it's just kind of strange to me that they were just sitting under a haystack. But that's, you know, a gruesome discovery that happened when the police were finally able to search the property. 
Both bodies that they found had multiple bullets in them and were badly decomposed. Their hands were tied across their chest, and their knees and feet were also bound with rope. The two people were later identified as her childhood friend, Margaret McQuillan, and her daughter, Sarah, who had recently gone missing around the same time frame that Paul was last seen. So dirty. I just don't understand why she killed them. It, it, I don't think this she will even never knows make why. sense to me. Yeah, it's just it has to be just this this serial killer thrill kill kind of thing, you know? Like she just needed someone, and she didn't have a lot of friends, didn't know a lot of people. Everybody crossed to the other side of the street when she came walking by, so she had to find somebody. And these are the only people that she was even remotely close to. Previously, she had only killed husbands. So maybe she was like, I'd like to try on women. Who knows? I yeah, mean, there's I no mean, logic. This was definitely a stray from her MO. This was yeah. did not fit in with her pattern whatsoever. And by all accounts, the McQuillan family was really good to her. Mm-hmm. And also, by all accounts, she was the one that had already wronged them by burning down their business. Exactly. You know, like how she could even approach them and go back up to them and be like, hey, it's me, the person that built down your saloon. It's no big deal. I'm here. Come hang out with me so I can murder you. Like, how does that even happen? Cojones. Right. It just, I'll I'll never be able to make sense of that. It just makes no sense. So both women had been shot execution style with a 32 caliber five shooter while they were already tied up. Sarah had also been shot three times in the heart. A matching loaded gun and two boxes of bullets were later discovered in a closet inside the house. It didn't take long for police to connect Lizzie to the McQuillan family, so they arrested Lizzie. While Lizzie sat in jail, law enforcement continued to search the property. Police were soon able to smell decomposition coming from underneath the floorboards inside the house, where they subsequently found Paul's body. Oh, Paul. I know. This poor little old man. It's just it's so sad. Lizzie's sixth husband, Paul Halliday, had a fractured skull from being hit over the head. He was then tied up by his hands and feet and then shot three times in the chest. Paul had also been stabbed and mutilated, but it's unclear if this happened before or after he was dead. We really don't have a lot of autopsy information, and I don't know how advanced the technology was so i just don't have that information but she definitely mutilated his his body during a subsequent search the body of a local peddler was also found on the property and that one i'm wondering you know i'm just wondering about motive about all of these and again it's a stray from her normal mo i'm wondering if it's just that he carried cash with him because he was a peddler and he was selling things i don't know but he was one of her last victims as well that's probably the most logical thing we can put with this right otherwise it just kind of doesn't make sense yeah well none none of this makes sense i don't even know why i said that <laughs> But like, it just really, she had only targeted her husbands, only targeted men, and especially older men. And then all of a sudden, we have three victims that don't match her normal MO. We got two, you know, family friends and one peddler that just, it doesn't fit. So I'm just kind of grasping at straws of like, trying to make sense of this, you know? Yeah. When police interrogated Lizzie, she didn't answer any of their questions. Instead, she babbled incoherently and she started tearing at her clothes. Again, she had seen people do in an institution previously, I'm sure. Of course, this is just a tactic for her to try and prove that she's insane. 
Many people believed she was attempting to fake insanity so she could avoid jail time yet again. There were plenty of angry townspeople who wanted to just storm the jail and hang Lizzie for her crimes. People, Yeah, people were just completely livid and outraged. Lizzie was charged with murder and sent to Sullivan County Jail. As she awaited trial, Lizzie continued to have numerous issues while she was in jail. The Times reported, quote, For a long time after her arrival, she refused to eat, and it became necessary for the jail physician to force liquid through her nostrils. In November, she tried to strangle the sheriff's wife. A few days later, she set fire to her bedclothes. In December, she tried to hang herself with the binding torn from the bottom of her dress. On December 15th, she came near ending her life by gashing her throat and arms in a terrible manner with glass broken from her cell window. For the last three months, it has been necessary to keep her chained to the floor. Oof. I think the movie is Pet Cemetery, the original. You know when the wife has that sister that is kept in an asylum or they keep her in the room or whatever because she has like I think it was like spina bifida or something and it's like the 50s or the 40s and they flash back to her childhood and that's that's my visual is just the the monster the pet cemetery sister on the ground do you know what I'm talking about I don't I haven't seen the movie I'm sorry the original please don't hate me (laughs) wait what there's so many movies that I haven't oh seen. I know. So I'm an close. embarrassment. <laughs> okay, so there's all these people out there screaming at me right now, just like, Curtis, David, shut up. But in Pet <laughs> Cemetery, there. Okay, we'll find it. I'll show you. You'll see. And you're going to go, oh my God, that's Lizzie. You're right. Well, what I imagined is that they're just like chaining her up like an abused dog, you know? I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I understand, like, she's a danger to herself, and they just are not very, I don't know, I mean, they're just not treating her like a human, you know? They're like, oh, she's a criminal, she deserves what she gets. It's a very, like, you know, punishment-oriented time, a vengeful time, but it's still just, it does make me sad. Even knowing everything that she's done... It really, really makes me sad knowing that they treated her like not a human, you know, yeah, and treated her like an abused animal. I mean, I wouldn't even chain my dog up and and just leave her like that for months, you know? No, of course. Yeah, I just, it breaks my heart, really. So on top of all this behavior, Lizzie also refused to keep herself clean and she let her hair get completely disgusting and matted. Although she went to severe lengths to harm herself and others, many people believed that this was all part of her act. As the trial got closer, the sensational news of her crimes and various events in jail were getting front page coverage in New York. Everybody was talking about this case. It wasn't long before everyone knew Lizzie's name and newspapers around the country began covering the story. The papers called her the Wolf Woman of Sullivan County. And reporters were all writing about her or attempting to interview her. The true story was strange enough as is. But of course, during this time with, you know, media being the way it was, newspapers and tabloids were also making up a lot of things to make the story even more sensational and get even more readers and more following for the story. One such rumor was that she had killed people in Belfast before arriving to the States. But like we know, she was only three when her family left Ireland and she hadn't been back since. So, of course, the rumor just wasn't even possible to be true. The other completely sensational story was that Lizzie was behind the infamous Whitechapel murders done by Jack the Ripper. What a stretch. 
it is absolutely insane that this even got traction, you know, but people started to believe it. And they really started to believe it because people were perpetuating the story, the media, people giving interviews. It was kind of insane that people were blaming it on her. Even the Sullivan County Sheriff, Harrison Beecher, issued a statement saying, quote, Recent investigations show that Miss Halliday is in all probability connected with the famous Whitechapel murders. He should not be the sheriff. No, that's completely irresponsible, unethical, just so many things wrong with that. Yeah, his job should have been taken right away. The sheriff gave media interviews describing how he had questioned Lizzie about it, saying, quote, I said to Miss Halliday, Lizzie, you're accused of the Whitechapel murders. Are you guilty? And she replied, do you think I'm an elephant? That was done by a man. <laughs> pretty good answer. (laughs) I mean, really, it's just like, I know that she's a murderer. But I mean, she's got to say you're being ridiculous. Like, of course, I didn't. I've never even been there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it just seems like it was either irresponsible police work or a publicity stunt to sell more copies because there's just no proof that she had ever even went to London, you know? Despite the fact that the information was not based in facts and there was just no evidence to support the claim, the story spread anyway, and there were definitely people that believed it. Her trial began on June 18, 1894, and Lizzie professed her innocence, entering a not guilty plea to Judge Edwards in front of a packed courtroom. Just like during questioning, she would tear her clothes and babble incoherently whenever court was in session. Because of the sensational media coverage and Lizzie's alarming behavior during the trial, the courtroom was packed every day. The spectators often didn't treat the trial with the seriousness it deserved, and the judge had to warn the crowd that he would clear the courtroom if they wouldn't calm down. What's interesting is, you know, this is like December, I think it said, of uh, 90, 1894. And I mean, she had just gotten back out in 1893. Like, this is so fast for her to be, you know, running a business and totally normal and fine to be ripping her clothes off, babbling incoherently, asking about Jack the Ripper. Yeah. You know, no, it's like it if was... you just look at the timeline of it, it's it's really easy to tear her whole story apart. Yeah, she just could not keep it together and not hurt people for just a matter of days or weeks. She would get out and then do it again. She would get divorced and then do it again. Her husband would die and she'd do it again. I mean, she had to do these things back to back. She had no self-control. She's disturbed, no doubt. But she's also aware that she can manipulate and try to be insane and get out of it or whatever. So it's like there's definitely, you know, it's both sides. Yes, absolutely. So without modern day forensics, the case against Lizzie was purely circumstantial, but there was plenty of evidence connecting her to the victims, as well as these records of her disturbing behavior. Her attorney did not refute much evidence or testimony presented by the prosecution because he was definitely counting on the fact that Lizzie would be found insane and sent to an asylum again. He really just wasn't trying to fight it. He was like, there's no way she's going to jail. Everybody knows she's insane. Yeah. He brought in multiple doctors from the institutions that she'd been in to testify that she was legally insane. The prosecution fought back with expert witnesses who testified that Lizzie was actually not insane. And many people, of course, still believe that she'd been acting in an attempt to bolster her insanity defense the whole time. Lizzie herself blamed the murders on a band of gypsies who she said were known to murder people and steal their valuables. Okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. The gypsies are wandering. They're stealing. But they're just wearing blinged out dresses, paving driveways, getting married at 14, (laughs) you know, using motor oil to tan. 
I mean, leave them out of this. She really, I mean, she's trying to grasp at straws here, you know, yes. and she's playing on this, you know, sort of racist stereotype of just like, yes. oh, we all know that gypsies are thieves and blah, blah, blah. Like she's making it seem like, oh, it has to be gypsies because she's saying something that's just prejudiced against this group. And the way that she delivered it in her testimony and the way that she talked about it, she made it seem like this group of people were just a known menace to the locals. Like all the people in the neighborhood knew that these quote unquote gypsies would often bury bodies to conceal their crimes and steal things from people and break into houses. She made it seem like everybody knew that this was a thing going on, but everybody else was just like, um, no. You know, like, this is not true. We've got maybe a couple bad apples or random people that steal that come through our area, but nobody's doing the kind of things that you're saying, you yeah. know? Everybody knew she was just making it up. And beyond the fact that people didn't really believe her story, there was also this element that through her own testimony it started to become clear that she knew way too many details of the crime to not have committed them herself. The things that she was saying about what happened to Paul and the McQuillans and the peddler, I mean, she was giving details that nobody else knew. So it just seemed like it backfired. You know, everybody knew that she had to be the one to commit these murders to know what she was saying. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, it's old timey, so you never even know. But I wonder if everyone, anyone even knew the peddler was missing. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, possible they that know. they didn't they didn't even know he was missing until he was dead. Right. Nobody could have been searching for him because he was out working and traveling and, you know, yeah. yeah, we just don't know. During the trial, it was discovered that Lizzie had offered her friend Margaret McQuillan a job cleaning a large boarding house for $2. A neighbor named Eveline Wright had seen Lizzie arrive and identify herself as Lizzie Smith. The neighbor said she arrived with a wagon to pick up Margaret on Wednesday night in August. On Saturday, Lizzie returned alone, saying that Margaret had suffered a fall and she was badly hurt. Her husband, John, testified that when he said that he would immediately come to bring her back home, Lizzie replied that the doctor would not allow him to come. And instead, he should send their daughter, Sarah, to basically help her mother recover and get better faster so that then the two of them can come home. And I don't know how she convinced him of that, you know, it may be just that it was supposedly an all-female boarding school or something. I don't really know. See, it's funny that you go there because I'm already just like, what happened? Like, what's the scam that she took Sarah and then like took her two dollars and killed her or something? But then like, what's the what's the rest of the scam? The long con here that now you need the daughter. Like, what do you have to do that you need these signatures or something? You know what I mean? Like, there's some reason. But again, oh, we can't say that. She's disturbed. She's mentally unstable. She has issues. They has, she has these moments of clarity where she can tell a good lie. But she is completely disturbed. She, we can't put any logic or reason on this and say like, oh, I wonder what it was if it was an all woman's. Like, it's a great theory, but we can't because it's like, there's never going to be an answer. She might have been like, oh, well, the flowers only bloom on the Tuesday when her daughter's here. Like, what? Okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I hear you. I mean, I definitely want to like grasp at straws and figure out the right? logic behind this and what's going on. But really, it really has to come down to the fact that she needed victims, that she yes. just wanted to hurt people. She wanted to kill people because she didn't really need anything. Her husband's gone. He has a little bit of money coming in from his business. She's got this big property she doesn't really need anything, you know, and it's not like the McQuillans are a rich family and she's trying to take their money, you know, she, yeah. I think, really kills because she wants to kill. 
She doesn't marry rich men. She marries old men because she wants to murder them. It's not about the money. It's not about just having a safe place to just have a home and be taken care of. It's about murdering. And she just wants to keep doing it. I agree. Yeah, it's just... Uh, it's a, it's hard to make sense of, but it's got to be like the motive is the murder itself. That's the only thing that makes sense. John also positively identified his daughter's clothing and accessories, along with his wife's rings, which were found in Lizzie's closet. But we were such close friends, you see, that she wanted to use my closet for storage space and I allowed her to. It's like she's got an excuse for everything that's perfectly logical. But then she also is completely portraying this insane character. Yes. So are we supposed to believe you because you are sane or not believe you because you're tearing at your clothes and babbling incoherently? Sure. You can't have it both ways. There's that. You know? So, yeah, it's just after he identified all these items, it became clear, you know, she took their stuff, murdered them and took their items. And on top of that, Lizzie's daughter-in-law also saw her wearing Margaret's rings and Lizzie claimed that her husband just gave the rings to her as a gift. So, uh, I don't know. It's it's odd enough to me like that the daughter-in-law asked her about it, right? You know, like something was wrong. She knew something was wrong. So, check it though. That's okay. I know I need to break this down for people, but that's the wife of her son that she threw to the institution and then brought back and this and that so like they still have a relationship to the point where his wife's around but she oh no it's the daughter it's the daughter-in-law it's like her husband's <gasps> paul's sons. kids yeah it's paul's kids oh yeah see, i needed so they're too. they're kind of looking for i get it now things of course that they're looking for miss. something so when they see she's got these new rings you know paul's family that have been around long before Lizzie arrived are just kind of like, let me find out what's going on. Did she steal his money and buy these rings? Like they're trying to piece things together. Paul's not here. He's, you know, doing masonry work and in his 70s in another town. Like what is going on? I have questions in Courtney's words, your catchphrase. I have questions. I do have questions (laughs) all the time. You know, I'm sure they were just trying to figure out what's going on and asking her questions because if anything weird happens, if a ring appears when you're a working class family, you got to wonder what happened. Totally noticeable. Yes. On June 27th, 1894, Lizzie was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to be executed by electrocution. Upon hearing the verdict, Lizzie lunged at Sheriff Harrison Beecher and bit his hand. This is for white trouble. Ah! <laughs> right. Right? Jesus. <laughs> She's insane. Yeah, I mean, She's just got these deep-seated no. rage issues. No, you know what it is? She has no impulse control. Yeah, that's a huge she part has, of it. She cannot control herself. It's not that she's insane. She's like, she's, I mean, she just, she physically can't control herself. That's what we're going to say. Yeah, got violence and rage issues. And when that violence and rage comes up, she has no anger management skills. She has nothing to control them. So every impulse she follows, she just does it. Yeah. So she, you know, just lunged out at him, bit his hand. And of course, they had known that she would be doing these outbursts. They had anticipated that she would get violent. So fortunately, he'd been wearing gloves any time that he was dealing with Lizzie, and this day was no exception. So initially, you know, the bite was just a small, manageable injury. But after a few weeks, it began to itch and burn. The wound later became infected and caused swelling that extended up to his elbow. And eventually, 
his arm had to be amputated. So crazy. That's just so sad. There's just so many victims of hers that just, uh, I just unbelievable to me how many people she harmed and hurt and killed. Yeah. Although she was initially sentenced to be executed, it was considered especially cruel to execute a woman, and the governor was more sympathetic to her insanity claims. Her sentence was eventually commuted by New York Governor Roswell Flower. Great name. Right? (laughs) Roswell Flower. Oh, that's like a stage name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. 30-year-old Lizzie was transferred to the Matawan Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where she would spend the rest of her life. She was never given an official diagnosis that we know of, and we just really don't know much about her treatment plan either. But of course, we know how early on this was in the entire field of mental health, so we can assume there wasn't much done for her. There wasn't much information compared to what we have now. So it's safe to say that the mental health industry was not very advanced at this time, and there wasn't really a great deal of treatment for whatever her mental illness was. While serving time in the hospital, Lizzie continued to be difficult and combative. She assaulted multiple guards and attempted to escape several times. In 1897, Lizzie and another patient attacked a nurse named Katie Ward in a bathroom. They began scratching her, pulling at her hair, and punching her until she lost consciousness. Kate survived the attack without permanent injury, and both her attackers were put in isolation. About nine years later, Lizzie was involved in another violent attack on a staff member. Lizzie had become close with a 24-year-old nurse named Nellie Wicks and had developed like the somewhat maternal fondness for the young nurse. Nellie had been very kind and skilled at dealing with difficult inmates, which earned her a promotion to being head of the women's unit. While she was head of the women's unit, Nellie would reward Lizzie for her good behavior with extra privileges. So Lizzie even got into acting, and she appeared in plays put on at the asylum with fellow inmates. She's probably pretty good. Right? With all the acting she's done that everybody claims she was pretending to be insane, I mean, maybe this is her skill, her calling. Yeah. In September 1906, Lizzie found out that her favorite nurse would be going back to school and was leaving the hospital soon. Lizzie was extremely upset that one of the only staff members that she really got along with would be gone soon. So leading up to Nellie's departure, Lizzie begged her not to leave. Initially, she was kind about it and tried to just say that, you know, she meant so much to the hospital and she meant so much to Lizzie and it would be not the same without her. But when asking nicely didn't work for her, she switched tactics to being threatening and trying to scare Nellie into staying. Pizza. Feeling like every night is pizza night? Pizza again? Spice things up with Cholula for a flavor that'll make you forget you already had pizza twice this week. Cholula hot sauce. The best thing ever to happen to pizza. Choose Cholula. During the last few days before Nellie left, Lizzie was constantly telling people that she would kill her rather than see her leave the hospital. Because by this point, it was just so normal for Lizzie to make threats on all kinds of staff members. The staff just ignored what she was saying. This was just commonplace. And they were like, all right, Lizzie's at it again. It's fine. On September 27th, 1906, which was Nellie's final day, she walked into the bathroom at 8 a.m. and didn't notice that Lizzie had followed behind her. Before Nellie could realize what was happening, Lizzie had pushed her to the floor. She stole her keys and locked the door behind them. 
Lizzie pulled out a pair of sewing scissors and stabbed Nellie over 200 times, mostly around her face and head and neck. Other staff members started hearing her screaming, so they ran to the bathroom and pulled Lizzie off of Nellie. I mean, that's just a frenzy. It's like blood in the water with sharks. 200 stab wounds to the face and head. That's the perfect description. It's a frenzy. This is a frenzied attack. I mean, she is completely losing it. Just, I don't know, seeing red in a rage blackout. Yeah. Lizzie was calm while she was taken into a solitary confinement cell. And she reportedly said, quote, she won't leave me now. Nellie had been severely injured by the time that help arrived, and within an hour of the attack, she had died from her injuries. I mean, they're all, like, thoughtless, senseless killings, but this to me is, like, this is the worst of them all. It's so sad, just this person that is dedicating their life to helping these women, who's worked her way up to the head of the women's unit, who's going back to school, whose life has so much promise for her to, like, help people and touch people's lives. And Lizzie's like, nope, nobody can have you. You're mine. And she's so good at what she does that Lizzie, specifically even, the non-help person, right? Like specifically likes her and knows she's good at what she does and then takes it all away from her. Yeah. Because she's upset. It's crazy. Her emotions are more important than anybody's life. You know, she's just willing to take anybody's life because she's upset. Oh, it's just monstrous. It's scary. Yeah. After her execution was commuted, Lizzie spent 24 years in the state hospital before she died on June 18th, 1918, at 54 years old. Lizzie Halliday was buried in an unmarked grave at the grounds of Matawan State Hospital. When she died, the New York Times described her as, quote, the worst woman on earth. And she's famous for being New York's first known female serial killer. In total, she had been married six times. Two husbands had died suddenly and unexplainably. And two husbands completely disappeared. She attempted to poison one and she shot the last husband. She's known to also have killed two friends, her stepson, a local peddler, and a nurse. That's a lot of people. So many people. And all of it, like you said before, is happening so fast. We're talking yeah. about, you know, a matter of being in jail for two years was the longest time she didn't kill anybody. She's yeah. just going, you know, month to month. Her marriages are lasting two weeks. I mean, she's just the Liz Taylor of serial killers. She's just back to back and just murdering everybody. Yep. Yep. So sad. And even though she wasn't even charged with all of the murders she committed, these men just kept dying. And of course, in the beginning, you can't see that there's a pattern. The law enforcement can't really link it to her. It's just there's just so many more things that have got to have happened that we don't know of. That's the thing that it really says to me, you know. So I found this great quote from John Conway, who's a Sullivan County historian and also a history professor at the State University of New York in Sullivan. He said about Lizzie Halliday, the most fascinating thing is that there was such a broad geographic area and so many potential victims. No one is really quite sure how many people that she actually killed. Yeah. And that just sums the whole thing up for me is just we have no idea how many others out there she must have attacked. Yeah. She has to have had boyfriends or affairs and these people disappeared, but nobody linked it to her because maybe it was just this clandestine affair that nobody knew about. You know, I'm just imagining there's got to be so many other people out there who their loved ones just disappeared mysteriously and they don't know that Lizzie Halliday's behind it. There's probably a lot of people that she attacked or did something to that got away and either 
didn't have information about her, you know, like a peddler, for example. Like, yeah, this chick attacked me. It she was looks crazy. like a snake. <laughs> she looks like a snake. She's got red hair. She's um, short. Snake, yeah, she's really redheaded weird. snake. <laughs> she's really angry. Um, but yeah, like the ones that got away, you know, and like there could be old, like I don't know what, it, just these old guys that are embarrassed they were had by some twenty-two-year-old, right? Right. So they don't say anything. And, like, maybe she poisoned him and he woke up and, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's, like you were saying, there's all these different scenarios. Every single one of them could have happened. Absolutely. I just think that this is, like, the tip of the glacier, you know? Yeah. To me, I just feel like we've got to have so little information compared to what she actually did. And it's yeah. so hard to trace back in these old timey cases, you know, like I said several times throughout the episode, it's just like, well, all we know is there was a marriage certificate and we don't know anything else, you know, like yep. there's so many missing pieces here. And, you know, the son went to, a, you know, a state run facility, but we don't really know what's up with him. Like there's so many pieces of this puzzle that have blank spots, you know, yeah. we've just got like these areas where we have to kind of fill in the gaps. And we don't really know the true extent of her evil, even though we know enough to say she is completely a monster or like New York Times said, the worst woman in America. But like, we don't know the half of it. I feel like there's so much more out there that if we like looked at various murders that took place during this time, within, you know, even like a five state range that we could attribute them to her and see if they match, you know, I just I think there's a lot more that we'll never know. Definitely. And I don't know, that's, you know, again, one of the things that makes old timey cases fascinating is that people can just disappear, you know, on the perpetrator and the victim side, and people can reinvent themselves on the perpetrator side, just completely leave one town, change their name to Smith, and then continue to do the same thing undetected. It's just completely baffling to me. You yeah. Know? And it's funny, too, because her name, it's like, if you really break this down, it's like Lizzie Margaret, like McNally Brewer, you know, uh, Hi what was Hiram's <laughs> right. like? Mortensen, Parkinson, Parkinson, Playstell, mm -hmm. McQuillan, like all, and then you know, uh, Halliday. Yeah, <laughs> it's like there was a Brown names. in there and a yeah. Smith in there. Yeah, you're right. There was a Brown and a Smith. You're right. It was just completely overwhelming the amount of names that she took on. She was just a woman that seemed to, in her mind, thrive in chaos and conflict. Yeah, absolutely. That's that. Yeah, so that's this is a good the one story for of Lizzie Halliday. I like this. It was one of the first cases that I found when I was like, okay, I'm going to look at New York cases. I think letter N is New York. There's some fascinating stuff there. And then I found Lizzie and I was like, oop, this is the one. This is the first. I got to look into this one. Because I am just completely in the rabbit hole. I was just all over scouring the internet trying to find information because it's hard. The older the case is, the less you can find information. And I was just really, really digging deep on this one. Yep. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about that. And um, I always think it's fun when people don't know about a case. So there's a little part of me that hopes that people listening have never heard of this one. And this is their first exposure because I just I love being that podcast that covers that lesser known case. A lot of people say that they cover lesser known cases. And then they're like, so we're going to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer. And I'm like, you fucking idiot. You know, <laughs> like, yep. but we really look for these ones that haven't had a lot of coverage. We actually search through podcasts and see how many podcasts have actually covered this case. Yep. So um, this is one of those ones where I'm like, this is a deep hidden gem. I feel like I shouldn't call it that, but there's some sort of other word for it. You know, this is one of those cases that I, I think very few people have heard of. I agree. So I think it was a great choice. 
Yeah, I hope that you guys enjoyed hearing about that. And maybe you guys have some theories that we didn't think of. So definitely let us know if you can, you know, get any semblance of logic applied to this case or any reasons that we didn't list or theories. Please tell us because I am baffled. I want to hear what you guys think. When there are old-timey cases, there tends to be usually then there's an old-timey following of that case that the people that do know have doctorates on the subject and wrote a right? dissertation. <laughs> so I'm really hoping like a Lizzie Halliday dissertation person with a doctorate and a master's comes forward and <laughs> lets us know everything we did wrong. That would be great. You're so right. Yeah, the people that are into like, let's say, Black Dahlia are yep. fanatics. Yep. There's a lot of old timey cases that people know a lot about. So if you're one of those people, holler at your girls because we want to know. Knowledge so is power. that's pretty much it for this week. Um, like we said at the top of the show, if you want to read any more about um, these this case and look at our sources and do a little bit more digging yourself. We'll put the resources in our show notes like we do every week, along with resources for things like domestic violence and mental health and addiction and all that kind of stuff. We always try and provide those links for you guys. We also have links to our thread list if you want some merch, some shirts and phone cases and tote bags and all that kind of stuff. Towels for the beach if you ever get to leave your house after quarantine. I was just going to say you can take your beach towel as you walk along the sand and make sure not to stop. Right. Don't, <laughs> don't sit with that towel. Don't get in within six feet of anybody on the beach, please. <laughs> you can stand in the water. I think that's right. great. Like you could stand in the water with a towel. But if <laughs> and you do were to some advertising for us. <laughs> yeah. If you were to stand on the sand with your towel, though, for longer than like 10 seconds. Oh, you better believe it's over. But if you have a shopping cart and like a tent in your hand or in your bag and like some kids carrying bags of dirt or something, they'll be fine with it. <laughs> they'll just be like, whatever. So let's see what else. Um. Oh, yeah. If you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we've got breaking news on there. We've got updates about when our episodes are coming out. We've got a ton of memes. We've got court uh, going to various locations and posting pictures of uh, locations of cases that we covered. That's correct. I recently, I have, um, if you are on our Patreon, you know about the ninja killer, David Lynn Scott. And so um, I went and I got tons of pictures a few months ago. I've just been like sitting on this that I need to post. And then for our upcoming Patreon yesterday, I went out and did a little recon on the area. So I have tons of information <laughs> and pictures as well. Yeah. So definitely check out our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and get all the inside information because court is on the case. Trying. And then the last thing is, if you want to join our Patreon, the link is in the show notes. It's patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. And we've got bonus episodes, ad free episodes, a bunch of stuff on there. And before we get out of here, we got to thank the new people that are on our Patreon. So thank you to Jenna, Gia, Casey, Shia, Kelly, and Kyle. And I'm I sorry think, about pronunciations. No, I think I think it might be Shahia. It's S H A I H A. Shaha or Shaiha, I think. Oh, maybe I'm reading it wrong then. So <laughs> we like it. We love we you. We appreciate you no matter how you say your name. And um, thank you for joining our Patreon. And we hope that you're enjoying the content. And like Court said, we are working on recording a new episode in the next couple days, I think. So yeah. fi fingers crossed. We'll get that out this week for you. And thank you again for being on our Patreon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope everybody is hanging in there. If you're essential workers, we thank you. If you're on the front lines of the medical community, we thank you so much for what you're doing. And we hope everyone's safe and sane out there. That's correct. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. We're just, I don't either. I'm sending a virtual hug to everybody out that's listening to this right now because 
we just, I don't know. I, I wish that I could just send all the kindness and love and hugs to everybody. The only so, thing that to me I can never think like relates is take care of yourselves and each other. Right. That's it. That's all I got. I think that's about like that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Take care of yourself and each other. Yes. That's perfect. Alrighty. Take care of yourselves and each other and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.